Hello everyone and welcome to part two of our final project video. In this video we're going to be going through our three possible final project topics. So let's start with the data science project. So in these documents, the documents give a little bit of background, some useful resources, and some of the things that I'm looking for with each project. Uh, and the remainder of the document is going to be a lot of the same information that's contained on the final project page. So we'll go through the unique parts of each of these uh, final project topic documents. The data science project is exploring this concept of data science. Now, as hardware has gotten more ubiquitous and it's gotten cheaper and it's gotten smaller, we've started to put smaller and smaller computers in more places. And this has led to this set of devices that aren't quite computers, but aren't quite dumb things as well. And so we call those things smart devices. These are things like thermostats that are connected to the internet, or even industrial equipment uh, sensors that are hooked up to some kind of controller. So lots of different things are generating data and there's lots and lots of data about lots and lots of things whether those be the movies people are watching or the chemicals coming out of a plant or the velocity in a river or different uh, the, the different places that a polar bear goes there's all sorts of data but in order to turn that data into anything useful we need to be able to process that data and analyze it. So this topic is focused on how do we do that? So in this project we're going to be writing a Java code that basically gives us some some essential summary statistics about a data set. So here's a couple of useful quantities that anytime we're looking at any data these are almost always the first things that an analyst will look at. The first is the range, the minimum and maximum of all the values. The second is the count, or how many values there are. We are also interested in the mean or the average, the standard deviation or variance. That's a measure of how scattered the data are. And we're also interested in the median or the middle. Now different types of data have different characteristics. And those characteristics make these quantities, make these different quantities uh, uh, change their relationships. So for example, if we look at a quantity like how tall people are, that's a kind of quantity that's distributed in a certain way. There's a given average height, and everybody is distributed around that average. And that distribution is such that most people are close to the mean and the further we get from the mean, if we're looking at extremely tall or ext extremely short people, those become more rare. Uh, so those observations become more rare. And so that's the kind of data where the mean and the standard deviation become really important. There are other kinds of data, for example, the total, the, if we look at uh, the income of every person in the United States. So this kind of data set, uh, the mean is not as useful and the standard deviation is not as useful. And the reason is, if we take the average income of every person in the United States, if everybody in the United States made $50,000 and one person made $100 billion, then the average is going to be way off the average is going to say, well, the average income of everybody in the United States is $700,000 or some huge amount. So it's not a very accurate way to summarize the data. In that case, with that type of data, the median is more useful. So this kind of gives you a sense of how different types of data uh, we, we're interested in different quantities. So in the case of the median, the median of every person in the United States income would, it would involve lining everybody up in order from lowest to highest. And then we would pick the person right in the middle of the, of the line and we would ask that person, what is your income? 
and that person's income would be the median income. All right, so what you're going to need to do for this project is some of these quantities you're going to need to look up in a textbook or in a technical book that gives a definition of how you compute these things for multiple pieces of data. With some of these, like minimum and maximum, it'll be obvious how to do that. But with some of them, like the standard deviation, you may need to go to a reference book to figure out the formula, and you'll want to include that formula in your final report. <clears throat> so this project is going to build on Worksheet 6, where you were extracting a single column from a CSV file containing data. And you can either use the same data you used in Worksheet 6, or you can pick a new data set that's e easier or more challenging or uh, something different that's, that's interesting to you. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to uh, build on that code. So you want to make sure your Worksheet 6 code works correctly. So you're going to start with that Worksheet 6 code with those two methods that you wrote. And then you're going to build functionality around that that will compute the range, count, mean, standard deviation, and median of those data. And you're going to compute those for each column of data in your data file. Uh, if you have columns of string data or timestamps, you can ignore those columns since these summary statistics aren't really meaningful in that case. So here's an example of what your program should be doing. If we have the following data file, this is a CSV file, we have comma separated variables A, B, and C. Then if we ran our program and fed it that data file, we should see an output like this. This is printing out the count, mean, median, standard, deviation, minimum, and maximum for each column. And it prints out the name of the column as well. So this gives us a lot of information at a glance about this data set. And as the data set gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets more and more useful to be able to summarize that data with a single table. All right, and these numbers are accurate, so these numbers do work for this data file. So if you want to verify that your calculations are correct and that you've correctly implemented your formula, then you can use this data as a test input. All right, so that's going to conclude this data science portion. So let's move on to the second project. All right, so this second project is covering a, a historical topic in computer science, and that is the Enigma machine. The Enigma machine was used by the German army and, or the German military in World War II, and it was used to encrypt messages. So the way that a lot of communication in World War II happened was through radio. So they were uh, transmitting messages through radio, and those were essentially being broadcast to anybody and everybody who was in the area who happened to want to listen in. So they needed to protect their communications, and to do so they encrypted the, these communications using this Enigma device. And this was about the size of a briefcase, or a small briefcase, or a box. And it contained this set of circuitry and electronics that anybody in the military could use to encrypt their communications. And this is important in the history of computer science because it led to the development of the first electronic computer. In order to crack this cipher, the British utilized uh, some work that these Polish mathematicians did to crack how the Enigma worked. And then Alan Turing, a mathematician, designed electronic computers that could crack this Enigma code. So the Enigma machine, as I mentioned, was a simple circuitry, uh, a bunch of electromechanical stuff in one wooden box. And the way it worked was you had a keyboard where the operator would start to type their message. So they would type their plain text into the keyboard. That signal that they typed, uh, out of those 26 letters, uh, the, each of those letters would create a different signal. And those signals would pass through a series of rotors 
and each rotor would match one letter to a different letter in the alphabet. So the Enigma machine is essentially a series of scrambling of letters where we're turning one of the letters in the alphabet into another letter in the alphabet and we do that multiple times. So to get a little more specific, when we type in a plain text letter that goes through a series of these mappings from one letter onto the other. Now those mappings are not the same as the Caesar cipher. So the Caesar cipher, what we were doing is we were shifting every single letter the same amount forwards. But the way the Enigma wheels or the wheel rotors or these uh, mappings work is any letter could map to any other letter. So the plug board was the first mapping or the first uh, shift that would happen. So it would turn a bunch of characters into a bunch of other characters. Uh, and you can see that an example here of a random uh, configuration. So if the operator typed the letter T, that would be randomly mapped to the letter K. Now what would happen next is that would pass into another wheel that was the static wheel. And this wheel would not move at all. And that wheel would pass that letter through. That would enter the first wheel. Now this right wheel is rotating. Each time the letter, the, the operator types a letter, this wheel starts to rotate. And this works like an odometer. Each wheel rotates at a different rate. Oops. So this right wheel rotates slowly, or, or excuse me, quickly, once each time a letter is pressed. The middle wheel rotates more slowly. So it rotates every uh, 10 or 26 or uh, yeah, 10 or 26 letters, uh, usually 26. So with the odometer, it would be the second wheel rotates every 10 miles. In this case, we rotate every 26 letters. The last wheel, the left wheel, will rotate uh, every, uh, every 26 times the middle wheel rotates. So every um, 26 times 26, or uh, 676, I believe. So the left wheel rotates every seven, 676 times. So let's go back to the wheels. Our operator has pressed the letter T, that went through the first rotor and turned into the letter K. So now the K letter enters the right wheel. That wheel is going to map the letter K onto the letter U. So again, that's a random mapping. Any letter can map onto any other letter. So our K gets turned into a U. Now that U signal comes out of the right wheel, enters the middle wheel, and we have a U signal coming into the middle wheel. That's then mapped onto another random character, in this case P, and that P signal comes out of the middle wheel. That P signal enters the left wheel, which turns it into another random character using another random mapping, so P gets turned into H. And finally, we enter the reflector, which is going to take that H letter in and again map it to a random character D. All of that signal is still just halfway through, so we're still got, uh, we've still got more wheels to go through. So we're going to pass back through the left wheel, D gets turned into G. We pass back through the middle wheel, G gets turned into R. We pass back through the right wheel, R gets turned into W. We go through that static wheel and again through the plug board, and we go through that last mapping. So W gets turned back into G. And all of this circuitry has happened all instantaneously, and a little light on the, the operator's device lights up behind the letter G. So the operator types the letter T. All of that encryption happens instantaneously, and the little light behind the keyboard uh, on the other side of the box lights up behind the letter G. And the operator says, OK, my plain text T is encrypted into the ciphertext G. And that's how we encrypt a single letter with the Enigma. Now we've typed one letter, so this right wheel is going to shift forward one, and now K is not going to map to U, K is going to map to some other letter. 
our R is not going to map to W, R is going to map to some other letter. So each time we type a letter, that encryption process changes just a little bit. Now this is a pretty complex device, so my recommendation is to start simple and spend some time on the device learning how it works. And what I've done here is I've given you quite a few resources that you can use to explore the Enigma device. Some of these resources talk about the Enigma at a high level and just describe the process. Some of them describe it at a lower level and actually give working examples with code or with uh, JavaScript widgets or visualizations. So I would encourage you to explore all of these. Now I'll mention this resource in particular, this code project implementation of the Enigma device in the C language. This one is pretty advanced, and it's a little complicated. It gets into some math, but it's still useful to take a look at. Um, so don't feel overwhelmed by it if you don't understand it, but just you know, take a look at it, see what you think. All right, so there's a lot of resources there. Um, uh, so avail yourself of those resources and of the description that I gave. And from here, the format of the project is going to be um, the same as what's on that final project page. All right, that's going to cover our Enigma machine project. So that's a, a project where you're implementing this Enigma machine in code. Our final project is the Twitterbot project. So in this project, uh, you're going to be implementing a Twitter bot. <clears throat> and the idea behind a Twitter bot is simple. It's just a program that interacts with Twitter and generates tweets. So what you'll be learning about in this, proce in this process is the concept behind the API, or Application Programming Interface. Now, Twitter is just one of many web services, and many web services provide APIs so that developers or programmers like us can interact with those web services with programs. So what we're going to do is we're going to interact with Twitter's API using the Java programming language. <clears throat> now the Twitter bot idea is really general. There's a lot of different things you can do with Twitter bots. So we're going to go through a few examples to give you some inspiration. But first, let's talk a little bit about the process that you're going to go through in order to send a tweet using a program. So in order to create a Twitter bot, you've got to first create a Twitter account for your Twitter bot. And then you're going to get something called a Twitter API developer key. And this is basically a key that allows you to build programs that interact with Twitter. Twitter doesn't want just any old person to be able to interact with Twitter with a program, so you've got to apply for permission. But they have essentially no standards, so all you have to do is say, can I please have an API key? And they say, sure, here's your API key. So it's pretty easy to get one. Uh, I've got a link here for uh, where you can apply for that developer key, and that describes their authentication system. So essentially, in order to apply for, so once you apply for that developer key and you get that developer key, you have to link together your Twitter account with your application. And you've got to have permission to create tweets on that account's behalf. And that's what this OAuth process is doing. So that's what this little description here is. Uh, the way that's going to work is it's going to generate a link, uh, your Twitter account, or essentially you sitting it in front of a browser will uh, go to that link and say, yes, I give permission to this application to tweet on my behalf. Uh, that then allows your bot to tweet with that Twitter account. Uh, the other thing that you'll need to think about is once you've got your bot authenticated and tweeting successfully, uh, you're going to have to have a computer that's running that Java program in order to actually tweet. So if you want your bot to run 24-7, 
you'll need a computer that runs 24-7 as well. Now you can get some free resources. Uh, Amazon Web Services provides a way to use Amazon Cloud Nodes for free. So if you want to learn a little bit about Amazon Web Services, you can also uh, do that as part of your project. Um, otherwise, you can just set up your computer and maybe run it a few times a day um, or once a day uh, and just tweet from your, from your bot once a day. All right, so let's go through some examples of what some Twitter bot, what some people have done with Twitter bots. And we'll start with this spiral aesthetic Twitter bot. So this is a Twitter bot that generates um, uh, animated GIFs using a program or using a graphics program, and then it it tweets out those images as animated GIFs. So if we look at all of these different things that this bot has tweeted out, we can see there are all of these interesting patterns that are generated uh, using this program. And it looks like it does this every couple of hours. It's generating these different patterns. So this is really fun to um, watch these patterns being drawn uh, and just kind of uh, see this computer generated art. Let's take a look at some other ones. Uh, this is a particularly interesting and complex Twitter bot. This Twitter bot is actually automatically generating these maps. So each of these maps is a computer generated image and then it comes up with a random name for whatever this map location is and it tweets out the image contained in the map. Okay, here's a simple Twitter bot that's simply tweeting out prime numbers. Uh, so this is all of the prime numbers starting at 2. And so this is kind of like uh, hooking up a Twitter bot with a simple algorithm that just looks for prime numbers. Uh, so we covered a, an algorithm to do that called the sieve of arachnocenes. Um, and we had this is prime method in our lecture notes. I believe that was in chapter two or chapter three. So here we've got a Twitter bot that's just um, turning that algorithm into a bot or into a Twitter account. Okay, another example of a simple concept uh, that's just tweeting out a couple of different um, um, atlases generated with emoji. So you know these tweets are basically just taking these emoji characters arranging them in some patterns and if you think about it these are just like the for loop patterns that we generated in chapter two when we learned about for loops except instead of printing out these um, funny star shapes or the Seattle um, uh, whatever it was the Seattle Sk Space Needle uh, ASCII art project this is just using ASCII character or um, emoji characters instead of ASCII characters, and is printing an atlas, a square atlas, instead of uh, a, a pattern. All right, so that's another idea to kind of get you started with some ideas. Now I'll give you another link here. This tinysubversions.com. This is an internet artist named Darius Kazemi, and he's got a whole bunch of Twitter bots here. Uh, you can take a look through this long list of different Twitter bots. Um, he's got all kinds of different ideas that he's explored, and it's quite a long list. So lots of different ideas um, that you can explore there. Some of them are uh, like this moonshot bot. I kind of like this one. You know, again, a simple concept of just taking images that are published somewhere and tweeting out those images. Uh, turned into a bot. So these are actually images from the Apollo missions that are published by NASA, um, or I guess in this case on Flickr. And so this bot is just printing or, or um, tweeting out those images. So again, lots of different ideas for you to explore there with this Twitter bot project. So I want to leave it open to you to um, explore with and kind of demonstrate your own creativity, explore things that you're interested in. All right, 
So that's about it. I've given you a couple of links at the end here. Um, one of these links is the Twitter for J project. Uh, I recommend using that as your software framework for taking care of all of this Twitter authentication. All right, and that's going to do it for our final project topics. So you'll need to take that survey online for picking your final project topic before next Monday. Um, but spend some time over the weekend exploring these ideas and maybe um, deciding on what you want to do. All right, and that's going to do it for this video. So we'll see you around. Thanks.